Our criminal justice system is profoundly sick. Uh, we lock up people for being mentally ill, for being poor, for being members of minority groups or of the LGBT community. That has got to change. You know, I'm a reformed individual who happened to uh, spend time in the criminal justice system. You know, the things that I did does not make up who I am today. When we began in the mid-1980s, uh, the, in the courtrooms in America, there were very limited options for how to do sentencing. In most cases, it was just a question of prison or probation. I found myself in the late 80s, early 90s, in the District of Columbia, as of all things, a prosecutor. It was the height of the crack epidemic. And when I went to court in D.C., I spent all of my time locking up young African-American men. If you go to criminal court in D.C., you would think that white people don't commit crimes. For some reason, African Americans were spending more time in prison, being punished more harshly for committing the same crimes white Americans were committing, spending less time and less harshness in those sentences. It's really interesting thinking back and kind of contrasting it with what the situation is today. We were about, what, five years into the Reagan term it was very much a lock them up and throw away the key era. Well, the United States has become a world leader in its use of incarceration. Uh, we lock up our citizens at a far greater rate than comparable industrialized nations and others as well. People have realized how costly it is to maintain the current criminal justice practices. You can find across America, people understand something's wrong. Our prisons are loaded and overcrowded. And yet, when it comes to the crime rate, there's no real change. It's not, I don't think by accident, that there's a disparity in the individuals who are more likely to wind up in the criminal justice system. Typically, that's men and women of color. This is the social issue of the 21st century. In the early years of the sentencing project, we were mostly engaged in helping to develop alternative sentencing programs, helping defense attorneys provide plans to a judge that would provide for an alternative to incarceration by addressing the underlying factors that contributed to the person's crime and responding to coordinating services in the community that could help the person succeed. Over the course of 30 years, we've seen reports that show um, the effect of mandatory minimums and three strikes laws and racial disparities in the criminal justice system so that people who talk about criminal justice policy are talking from a point of view of information and not rhetoric. So we started doing more research, we started asking more questions, we started engaging with policymakers about how can we uh, anticipate where these policies are leading us and trying to call attention to what we thought and unfortunately were correct was the development of mass incarceration. The way that the sentencing project has, has pulled out that data and, uh, and publicized it has been so helpful in the country. They were the first people to start collecting the data that detail this vast expansion in mass incarceration and this vast expansion in race disparities. They're the people who told the story of what was going on. They bring to our attention those specific cases that we can use to dramatize the need to get this done. I can't say enough for their research work. Over time, we began to take a larger look at the system overall. What is the criminal justice system producing? What are its effects? What are the problems? And that helped our work move much more in the direction of doing research, advocacy, trying to examine the whole functioning of the criminal justice system and point out its problems and point to ways to do things better. No matter who the law enforcement expert is you talk to, they'll tell you they're looking for data-driven policing. But having data-driven policing and data-driven law enforcement requires you to collect the data. No one does that like the Sentencing Project. And the Sentencing Project has in that way pushed the conversation uh, in a direction towards effective and fair and race-neutral reform.
So what can we do to make sure that we take some of the resources now going into corrections unnecessarily, put it instead into law enforcement and community development and education and jobs that will really bring the crime rate down in America? When they started the sentencing project, they might have thought it would just take a few years. And here it's taken 30 years so far, and maybe it'll take another 30 years. But that perseverance over time to keep at it is an important skill and value. We hope to be able to stay uh, very much in the forefront of shaping that conversation, of asking questions, hopefully providing answers about how we could do things better and differently. Let's all imagine where this beautiful struggle should take us. So hopefully in 30 years from now, we're not going to be talking about mass incarceration. We're not going to be talking about race disparities. Let's make sure we're smart when it comes to sentencing, not just tough, but smart, and make certain that those who are incarcerated are truly a danger to society, and that those that are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes are not left in prison to languish for decades or perhaps for their entire lives. My hope is that we can see the sentencing project continue for 30 years plus. I'm convinced with the kind of data and research that they do, if they continue to push ahead, we'll be able to do just that.